Part One. You'll hear a conversation between Alan and Gianna, the office counselor of a company. First, you have some time to read questions one to six. What's up, Gianna? You look like you're in bad shape. Yes, maybe I'll get sickly from the boss and finally catch up on some sleep. I've barely eaten and slept in days. Those are warning signs of occupational stress. How are things at work? Terrible. After all the layoffs lately, the workload is totally overwhelming for everyone that's left. So I spend every waking moment in the office. I'm kept busy all the time. So you need to take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind. But my boss will complain I'm not hard working. She's so capricious that you can't predict her reaction sometimes. Maybe your boss just doesn't have a clue about how much you're really doing. Keep her updated on your achievements and projects. Also insist that she prioritize everything so you can manage your time better. That's right. I suppose that would help me regain some sense of control, but I'm afraid that she'll take that as a sign of laziness and give me the axe. So take the initiative and hit the job hunting trail now. You'll be surprised at how many opportunities are out there. Well, that's encouraging. Anyway, you should cheer up and get rid of the situation. You know, according to a survey, about forty percent of all people. Find their work very stressful, and twenty-five percent develop mental or physical diseases. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. So serious? I didn't know that. How do the problems start? You know, they start when conflicts at work induces stress. Your body reacts by flooding the bloodstream with hormones that tense up your muscles and increase your blood pressure. This is meant to save you in a fight or flight situation, but leads to a host of illnesses, ranging from insomnia and headaches to heart attacks. When it occurs regularly over an extended period of time, what should I do to prevent such things happening? Well, most occupational stress is attributed to a recognized lack of control. You should act in advance to relieve the problems. For example, you should actively pursue career opportunities rather than quietly worry about getting fired. Of course, you can't control everything. So you need to help your mind and body cope. Keep a journal to release your frustrations. Take short walks to calm down, or if necessary, simply take a mental health day. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a monologue about a guided tour to London. First, you have some time to read questions.
Hello, can I just have your attention for a minute? Thank you. My name is Mary Golding. Some of you may recognize me. I used to be a lecturer here at the college, but I changed jobs last year and now I work as the student officer. Okay, well, I'm in today to tell you about a guided tour that we've got going to、um, London. Well, this will be a good chance for those of you who haven't been to London before to have a look at this beautiful city. I think those of you who come will thoroughly enjoy it. The trip is going to be for five days, from the 31st of March, which is a Saturday, to the 4th of April, the following Wednesday. We'll be taking a medium sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. Last time it was a minibus with only 16 places, which proved insufficient for students' needs. According to the London Development Agency, London has over 200 museums, 500 cinema screens, 108 music halls, and five symphony orchestras. Needless to say, we can't see it all in one day. Here are some major sites we are going to tackle on the first visit to London. On the first day we're in London, we'll be going on a boat trip up the River Thames and up the London Eye. The Eye is a giant modern Ferris wheel which stands on the south of the river across from the Houses of Parliament. The boat cruise is included in the cost of the trip, so you won't need to worry about spending extra money. But you have to pay to ride the Eye to gaze out over the vast city. After that, we'll visit the Houses of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament, also known as Westminster Palace, was designed in the Gothic style. One of London's famous landmarks, Big Ben, the clock tower named for its 13 ton bell, is also found here. You can have a free visit up there. I think you all know Westminster Abbey, one of the most visited Christian churches in the world. There is no admission charge for this, but there are lots of souvenir shops around, so you might need some money for those. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. On the second day, we'll be going to the British Museum. The oldest museum in the world is also the most visited site in London. You have to pay to get in there, but it's not expensive. The museum's newly constructed one hundred million pounds Great Court, a two-acre square enclosed by a glass roof, is the largest covered public square in Europe. It is called the Great Court. On the third day, you'll be free to do whatever you like. Personally, I recommend the Natural History Museum. It has over 68 million specimens. Fun exhibits include the Blue Whale exhibit, Rainforest Gallery, Earthquake Experience, and Dinosaur Displays. The Globe Theatre is a place worthy of visiting. The original Globe Theatre, where actors performed William Shakespeare's plays, burned down in 1613. The newly reconstructed Globe, however, Copies original drawings of the 16th century's buildings' details and uses many of the same techniques and materials. Theatergoers can see performances of Shakespeare's plays, such as Romeo and Juliet, and Much Ado About Nothing. If you'd like, can you sign up on this form on the student notice board by Friday? It'll be first come, first served. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a discussion about how to manage time. First, you have some time to read questions.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's discussion is time management. It's very important that you develop effective strategies for managing your time to balance the conflicting demands of time for study, leisure, earning money, and job hunting. Here is an exercise which will help you to identify areas in which you might be able to improve your time management. Try to answer the 40 questions as honestly as you can, and then score yourself from 1 to 4 in each area. You have 5 minutes to finish them. OK, please stop and look at the screen. According to your answers, you can find in which area or areas you get the minimum scores, and I can give you some strategies to improve them. I find I get the lowest score in the area of using lists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. I don't have the habit of keeping a list. What use does it have? Keeping a to-do list is a useful reminder system to tell you of when you need to do what. Don't try to remember everything in your head. Carry a pen and paper or organizer wherever you go to write down the things you need to do, including appointments and deadlines. Do you think a daily list of tasks is necessary? Yes, it is an excellent way to focus your mind on important objectives. Make sure you update your list daily, crossing off completed tasks and adding new tasks. Urgent or important tasks can be highlighted with an asterisk. I find it difficult to set goals. How do I set myself specific and clearly defined goals? You must make sure that these goals are realistic and achievable. To do this, you first need to examine your present situation and assess what goals are important to you and what action you need to take to achieve your target. I am in the final year and trying to find a job. I can't combine the pressures of intensive study with finding time to apply for jobs. Sometimes you need an alternative route to your goal in case you have to change your plans. For example, taking a relevant postgraduate course if you can't get a job. Whenever the examinations sneak up, I start getting nervous. I don't know how to organize my time to deal with so many subjects. You should have a regular venue for revision, such as the library, where you're free from distractions. Plan out a revision schedule or timetable so you devote enough time to each subject. You can also use past examination papers when revising to familiarize yourself with the sort of questions that might be asked. When revising, take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind and allow some time off for complete relaxation. I'm always late for everything. You know, the sort, the, the deadline of papers and seminar reports. Sometimes I cannot make decisions immediately, so I ignore them on purpose. So you fall into the area called procrastination. I think it's important that you manage your fear of doing things you don't want to do and realize that the fear is often far worse than any possible negative result. The best time to do something is usually now. Taking action generates the energy for further action. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on MSG. First, you have some time to read questions.
You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favorite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a chemical commonly used to add flavor to salty or sour tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908, but Eastern cooks have been using glutamate rich seaweed as flavoring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavor of food. Foods often used for their flavoring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavor of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savory, broth-like or meaty taste. Umami may be the fifth basic taste beyond salty, sweet, sour, and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savory taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy, and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavors in a variety of foods such as meat, poultry, seafood, and vegetables. While MSG harmonizes well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods. Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8% MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavor. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavor of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavor. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome, quality food and good cooking techniques. MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavor of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30%, but food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as 1-2%. to Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use but for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.